magnetic hertz demonstrate the reality of electromagnetic waves following the publication of Maxwell's theory. About 11 years later, Marconi demonstrated the transmission of radio waves across the English Channel. And in 1904, Sir Ambrose Fleming applied for his patent on his two-electrode valve, as he called it. In 1907, Dr. Lee DeForest patented the three-element audion, which was the true beginning of electronics. And about 1910, the first practical audion was built for general sale. So the question is, what were used for detectors between, let's say, 1900 and 1911, when the audion became truly practical for even shipboard systems? And what were some of the characteristics of these? And this is what I hope to show in this video, perhaps with some demonstrations of detectors, as well as some of the more arcane history of detectors in those years. Now one of the questions that uh, comes up is, how did Marconi and his early experiments have a reasonably good detector like the Cohere so readily available all of a sudden? I'm going to read from a couple of books on this subject. One is uh, Wireless Telegraphy by Alfred Story, written in 1905. And he says, Sir Oliver Lodge tells us that probably the earliest discovery of cohesion under electric influence was contained in an observation by Guitar in 1850, that when dusty air was electrified from a point, the dust particles tended to cohere into strings or flakes. And then he goes on to discuss some applications of this by Mr. S. A. Varley. And uh, this is uh, taken up again in the book Flame, Electricity, and the Camera by George Isles, written about the same time. And in uh, speaking of the development of the co coherer, uh, Mr. Isles says that as long ago as 1866, Mr. S. A. Varley noticed that black lead reduced to a loose dust, effectively intercepted a current from 50 Daniel cells, which would be about 70 volts, although the battery poles were very near each other. When he increased the electric tension four to six fold, or about 250 volts, the black lead particles at once compacted themselves so as to form a bridge of excellent conductivity. And he went on to use this in a, a lightning arrestor, apparently. And then he talks about Professor Temistocle Onesti in Italy in 1885 in an independent series of researches discovered that a mass of powdered copper is a non-conductor until an electric wave beats upon it. Then in an instant the mass resolves itself into a conductor almost as efficient as if it were a wire. Professor uh, Edouard Branley in Paris, who most people in this business have heard about, in 1891, on this principle, devised a coherer which passed from resistance to invitation, as he calls it, when subjected to an electric impulse from afar. And he continued to develop this, and as most people know, uh, Marconi took this development of Branley's and uh, perfected it to something uh, that was then a, quite a sensitive detector for the time. Well, here we see a reconstruction of Edouard Branley's laboratory as it uh, is now at the Musée de Radio France in Paris. Like so many other experimenters in this field, uh, Professor Branley did not actually make practical use of his invention of the coherer, and this was left to Alexander Popov in Russia, first of all, who used it to detect thunderstorms and he also improved it somewhat and then in 1896 uh, Guglielmo Marconi using uh, Hertz's and Branley's and Popov's technology managed to transmit the first radio waves and saw immediately the practical applications of this uh, detector of radio waves. Well here I have a little experimental setup which is meant to reproduce Branley's early experiment in the middle of the picture you see uh, my coherer and uh, I'll take a little closer look at that right now and you can see how it's constructed. So just as Branley did I have here two strips of tin foil 
with a small gap in the center, and bridging the center is a pile of uh, copper filings. And this is all on a sheet of glass, and I'm going to feed a 9-volt uh, battery through this to a meter, and we'll see what happens uh, when I perform the experiment. Well, here I have my coherer on the glass plate, a meter here, uh, to show the 9-volt uh, circuit when it's completed. And I have here an electrolytic capacitor, which is going to serve as my spark source. So now I will... So I have the coherer set up here, and here's my meter showing the uh, full 9 volts for my battery. So I'm going to tap the coherer, as they did in the old days, and try to get it into a, a high resistance but uh, sensitive uh, state. So I'll tap it a few times. There it goes. I'll now try my spark. And there you see the cohering action, just as uh, Branley did in his experiments uh, so long ago. I'll try it one more time. Might get lucky. Give it a few taps. Get it down into its uh, sensitive position. Make sure my capacitor is charged. Do the discharge. And there we have the cohering action again. So that's the essence of Branley's experiment. Of course, uh, Popov and Marconi improved upon this. Marconi, in particular, got the coherer to be quite a sensitive detector of uh, radio waves, and we will uh, pursue that a little later on. Here I have a diagram of the coherer. It's usually a glass tube, maybe two inches long, and an inside diameter of about a tenth of an inch with two silver plugs and uh, connecting wires attached to them. And it, the space between the two silver plugs is usually about one sixteenth of an inch. I've followed the usual directions for the filings, which are between these silver terminals. And it's 96% nickel and 4% silver. Some books say that a very minute amount of mercury will also increase the sensitivity. When Marconi perfected his coherer, of course, he had this in an evacuated tube, so none of the electrodes or filings could oxidize or tarnish in any way. And he achieved quite high sensitivity, according to everything that one reads. Here I've uh, constructed a model of a coherer, according to instructions in an old book that I have here and uh, I'm going to see how this reacts to ordinary radio waves. As you can see, the actual coherer is a glass tube, from a fuse actually, with two uh, nails from either side, and in the middle there's the uh, mixture of nickel filings and 10% uh, silver, as per the instructions in the book. This is my uh, local radio station that I'm going to use for the radio frequency source to test the coherer. This appears to be about uh, one volt peak to peak coming out of my antenna here in the basement. And I'm just going to touch the antenna lead to the coherer and see if that's enough to trigger it. As before, I'm uh, using a meter to uh, show the condition of the coherer and I'll uh, try the antenna lead here and there you see it did trigger the coherer and that is about as I say one volt into the coherer so that gives some idea of the sensitivity of these units. Now I admit this one is not as sensitive as those that Marconi and others used but if we take uh, a guess that mine is only a tenth as good as theirs, probably a calculation can be made about the sensitivity uh, that was being achieved in those days. Well, one of the things we wanted to do was to determine what is the sensitivity of a coherer and then what would be the power required um, for a transmitter to get any reasonable signals at a coherer um, over a certain distance or any reasonable distance. And there are a number of formulas that have been used over the years, back since uh, 1910, uh, which one can use to calculate this. For example, the voltage in the receiving antenna is a function of the height of the transmitting antenna, height of the receiving antenna, current into the transmitting antenna, and the wavelength and the distance. 
Then there's the radiation resistance. It's a function of the height of the transmitting antenna and the wavelength. There's the efficiency of the antenna. That's the ratio of the actual radiation resistance at the wavelength at which you're operating over what the radiation resistance would be if the antenna were a lambda by four antenna. So the power then is just the radiation resistance times the square of the current into the antenna. And the power into the antenna itself is the radiated power over the efficiency. So one can go through these uh, calculations and determine, let's say for a hundred kilometer distance, uh, what kind of power would be needed at a transmitting antenna in order to get the cohere to operate uh, effectively or reliably. So we'll go through those calculations briefly and see what the answer is. Just before I do the calculations, uh, here are those uh, formulae again, a little bit closer up uh, so you can see what they are. These are actually mostly summarized in the Admiralty book uh, for wireless operators uh, written in about 1939, although obviously there are other uh, books which you can consult for this information. Here I have carried out these calculations that I was speaking out before. Here I'm assuming a transmitting antenna height of 60 meters, receiving antenna height of 30 meters, distance of 100 kilometers, and a wavelength of 600 meters, which is about 500 kilohertz, although I realize in the days of the cohere they're using a shorter wavelengths, or rather, sorry, longer wavelengths. Here is the voltage at the receiving antenna, I've calculated it out, um, assuming with my uh, experiment with cohere where I needed about one volt peak to peak, if Marconi's, as I said, was maybe five times better than that, I assume a requirement for 0 0.2 volts uh, at the receiving antenna to make the cohere operate. This calculates out to a, an antenna current at the transmitter of 17.7 .7 amps. So calculating the radiation resistance, it's about 31.6 ohms. And if it were a lambda by four antenna, this would be about 39 ohms. So therefore the efficiency of the antenna is calculated, I guess optimistically at 80%. This gives then a power radiated of 9,900 watts or a power into the antenna of this divided by the antenna efficiency which comes out to 12,375 watts. That to me seems in the right ballpark for transmitters of the time knowing roughly the sensitivity of the coherer. Uh, we know that uh, Mark Coney's early experiments used a transmitter of about 7,000 watts. So all in all, uh, this seems to be roughly what one could expect. Fairly high power transmitter in a relatively long wavelength, insensitive coherer requiring uh, 200 millivolts, in fact, uh, at the antenna to make it operate reliably. So that's the story on the coherer. I'll now uh, proceed on to other types of detectors used in the early stages of radio communications. I'm still on the subject of detection and required field strengths. I'm reading from the Handbook of Wireless Telegraphy, 1938, Volume 2, where it gives some field strengths that were deemed to be required in those days with the kind of equipment they had. Now, admittedly, this is for early, relatively insensitive tube-type equipment. It's not uh, non-amplified detectors like coherers and crystal detectors and so forth. But still, in the um, MF broadcast band, the field strength in microvolts per meter is given as follows. They say very close to high power stations, you can expect about 100,000 microvolts per meter. And the required value for good telephony service in towns where there is bad static is stated to be 5,000 to 30,000 microvolts per meter. And um, 
a thousand microvolts per meter is stated to be quite a good telephony signal but needs radio frequency amplification and has a very poor signal to noise ratio. So they give some idea of uh, requirements in the early days of vacuum tube technology so you can be sure that with coherers and magnetic detectors, crystal detectors and others that the required field strength is going to have to be much higher than that. And when you consider that today many receivers will get a good signal at about uh, 10 microvolts per meter, these are indeed uh, very, very um, high strength signals. As time went on there was a search for more reliable detectors, in particular uh, replacements for the coherer, which didn't require the mechanical tapping to restore their sensitivity. One of these was the so-called graphite detector, which has a couple of rods of graphite with a steel needle laying across to make a microphonic contact, as it was called at the time. I'm now going to uh, demonstrate such a detector, which I have prepared according to some instructions in a book, which I have. Well, here is my experimental setup. I have uh, in the middle of this picture the two steel needles with a, with a rod of graphite laying across it and off to the right is my uh, tuner, a variable capacitor and my antenna coil and I actually have an amplifier attached to this one so that the results can be heard. I'm actually going to use it as a um, detector rather than actual coherer as it was originally designed. This just makes it easier for our video. Here you see the two needles uh, coming out from uh, the backing board with the rod of graphite across it. It's actually a pencil lead and according to instructions these needles had to be heated uh, till they're slightly red and then allowed to cool to obtain a blue coating and they were slightly roughened as well and this provides the uh, supposedly rectifying and a microphonic circuit which is uh, required for what is called an autocoherer. The idea being that it does not require any tapping and automatically restores itself. Well here is my autocoherer setup again. I have an amplifier connected to it for the purposes of making this video so I'll now connect the antenna and see how it works. see it is working as a ordinary radio detector with the local radio station which I have here. I know from an experiment by replacing the coherer with a germanium diode that it's about half as sensitive as an ordinary diode detector would be. Therefore this is not a terribly good detector. It's also very unstable and it's quite noisy. There's a background hiss as well. Here you see the circuit that I used for this auto coherer. It's a parallel tuned circuit at the input with the coherer shown at the top, the two arrows with the bar across them, and then the usual earphones and the condenser across them. But this detector requires a bias voltage, and for this I've used a 9 volt battery with a 500 ohm rheostat, and I find a bias of about two and a half volts gives the best sensitivity for this detector. As I said before, even at that, it's probably only about half as good as a normal geranium diode detector. There was also a uh, British scientist who did a lot of pioneering work on coherers. I meant to mention that before, but he didn't uh, ever take the steps necessary to commercialize it or even think of the possibilities of electromagnetic wireless telegraphy. In fact, quoting from one of his statements, he says, stupidly enough, no attempt was then made to apply any but the feeblest power so as to test how far the disturbance could be really detected. Mr. Rutherford, however, 
with a magnetic detector of his own invention, constructed on a totally different principle, did make the attempt in June 1896 and succeeded in signaling across half a mile of intervening streets at Cambridge. So there's some chagrin on uh, Oliver Lodge's part that while he did the experiments in front of the Royal Society, he never did think of its commercial applications. Now we're going to turn to our own man, uh, Dr. Reginald Fessenden. Well, here is uh, Fessenden himself. Reginald Aubrey Fessenden, in his uh, radio encyclopedia, Hugo Gernsback says that he was born at Milton, Canada, October the 6th, 1866, and educated at New York and Port Hope, Ontario. He says uh, further that Fessenden became inspecting engineer for the Edison Company, New York, and afterwards professor of physics and electrical engineering at Western University, 1892. He goes on to say that in 1906 and 1907, Fessenden invented a number of microphone transmitters, and he was also working on several improvements to detectors, and that's the particular aspect that I want to explore here. Dr. Fessenden was interested in finding a detector that was more reliable, uh, less critical to adjust than the coherer, and one of his ideas was the bolometer detector. What this is, is a, an extremely fine platinum wire enclosed in a vacuum, and the idea is that uh, radio frequency energy impinging upon this very fine wire will rapidly change its resistance, and this can be detected uh, if the bolometer is put into a wheatstone bridge where small changes in resistance can give relatively large responses. So. Even though I don't have a bolometer of this kind, um, one can use a tungsten filament lamp, a very small one of high resistance, which tends to change its resistance rapidly as it heats up. So that's what I'm going to do uh, for the Fessenden bolometer detector experiment. Here you see my circuit diagram, if you remember what the Wheatstone bridge looks like. It's, um, I guess you could call it a rectangle with a resistance in each arm of it with uh, battery power supplied across uh, one arm or two arms rather and some sort of uh, measurement device like a meter across the other arms and you balance it with a rheostat. So on the left you see I have a series tuned antenna circuit and a B is a type 327 24 volt tungsten lamp so that when the circuit is tuned to resonance you get maximum current from the antenna through the lamp down to ground and that lamp has its uh, equivalent over on the other side of the bridge that's the 100 ohm rheostat which I can adjust to balance the bridge so what I do is with the antenna removed I balance the bridge so that the meter is showing some uh, rather low but constant uh, reading after allowing everything to stabilize. Then I attach the antenna and uh, see what difference there might be as the lamp heats up very, very slightly from the energy that I'm getting from my antenna. And remember, I'm using a local radio station giving about uh, one volt peak to peak or something like that. And we'll do the experiment and see how the bolometer reacts. Here is my experimental setup. You can see on the left I have a uh, 50 microamp uh, meter movement. And then on the right is my uh, tuning coil, tuning condenser with the bridge battery and my little lamp as a bolometer in the middle. That's shown at the orange arrow. This is the little uh, Type 327 24 volt lamp. It uh, seems to show enough resistance change when the antenna is applied that the principle of the bolometer detector uh, can be demonstrated. Over here are the resistors and uh, rheostat forming the other parts of the bridge. So I'll now get the meter stabilized and uh, see how this works. And just while we're waiting for things to stabilize, here's the local radio station that I'm going to use as my signal source. Again, it's um, CFRA here in Ottawa, uh, about one volt peak to peak on the antenna. 
Everything seems to be stabilized now, so I'm going to apply my antenna. This is a very highly damped meter, so the movement is going to be slow, but I'll now apply it. You'll see that it's currently reading about uh, 22 microamps. So I'll apply my antenna there, and you see the bolometer reading rising. Well, I'll just try that once again since the meter is stabilized somewhat below where it was before. So I'll apply the antenna. And there you see the needle rising again. And that's an indicator that the lamp is being slightly heated by the radio frequency energy I'm getting off my antenna. Of course, one of the problems with this type of detector is although it might be uh, sensitive in the configuration that Fessenden devised, still it's uh, very, very easy to burn out. And that's a wire that is 0 .00006 inches in diameter, barely visible in fact, and anybody who has worked with microwave power meters knows how easy it is to burn out the sensor head on them and they work on the same principle. So while this was a very stable detector and requiring no adjustment, it was only relatively successful as I understand it. Well, as you can see from these experiments, the search for detectors was largely a matter of trial and error without a lot of uh, scientific basis. Uh, reading from a book by Oliver Lodge, Modern Views of Electricity. This was written just in 1892 after Hertz did his experiments. He said that uh, with respect to uh, the detectors other than Hertz's small spark gap, since Hertz's discovery that little sparks could be excited in a conductor exposed to electric radiation, various other methods of detecting radiation have been devised. Dr. Dragumas, working in my laboratory, has used vacuum tubes and has showed that they glow in the oscillating field near an electric vibrator without being attached to wires or any form of conductor. So that's uh, phosphorescence in a, uh, in a vacuum tube. Another mode of detecting electric radiation is by its heating effects. The late Mr. Gregory of Cooper's Hill constructed a very delicate arrangement of a fine wire attached to a spiral shaving and a mirror, whereby extremely minute changes of length were translated into perceptible rotations. It's sort of like a miniature hot wire ammeter. And he also says, um, for making the effects merely visible at a distance, perhaps the best method is that discovered by Prof. Fitzgerald, who found that if the two halves of an ordinary Hertz receiver were connected with a f delicate fine wire galvanometer, its needle was disturbed whenever the little scintilli, that's the sparks, ordinarily depended on, occurred. So there seemed to be a desperate search for what I might call physical effects as opposed to electrical effects for detecting these new Hertzian waves. So what I want to do now is go on to a different kind of uh, what was called auto-coherer, and this is the so-called mercury-iron-carbon coherer. Well, here is a drawing of the carbon mercury iron auto coherer. You'll see that once again it's contained in a glass tube. On the left hand side there is a carbon block. In the middle is a drop of mercury and uh, coming out of the tube on the right is a iron plunger. This iron plunger has to be firstly heated in a torch to red heat and allowed to cool so that it develops a blue oxide on its surface and this prepares it for use in this particular detector. The detector is adjusted by very carefully moving the iron plunger in toward the globule of mercury until uh, detection occurs. And unlike the iron filings go here, this one is a continuously operating detector, much like a crystal detector, in fact. So I've now prepared uh, such a detector, and uh, I'll firstly show the circuit diagram that I use. So here's my diagram. There's obviously not much very complicated about it. I have the antenna and ground feeding a parallel tuned circuit with the mercury-iron-carbon coherer 
in series with the uh, headphones. The difference is that this appears to be quite a high impedance detector, at least in its most sensitive position. And for that purpose, uh, high impedance phones should be used. It's uh, somewhat hard to get 4,000 ohm telephones, but they do exist. And uh, in fact, they work better than the 2,000 ohm type. What I've done again here is feed my coherer into an amplifier so that for the purposes of this video, uh, we'll be able to hear the result. Here you see an overview of my iron mercury carbon coherer with the uh, little tuned circuit on the right hand side. I've uh, actually been able to receive uh, another radio station here which is uh, according to my calculations about 93 millivolts per meter field strength down here in my basement with my 3 meter antenna. So this is in fact uh, quite a bit more sensitive than the original uh, nickel filings coherer which I demonstrated earlier in this video. And here is a close up of my detector or auto coherer. You'll see the iron nail on the left hand side, a little drop of mercury in the middle, and on the right is a carbon rod. This is actually something of course that I've got out of a small flashlight battery and you see the connection on the end of it. So this is the equivalent of the uh, coherer that was built in the early days. It's also swiveled on a joint in the middle so that it can be slightly tilted. It seems to be easier to adjust that way when the globule of mercury is down near the iron nail. Well, I'll now turn up the uh, volume on my amplifier and we'll see um, what the results are like. <laughs> Time 3-2 over the Kings. Freddie Brathwaite and the Flames blank the Columbus Blue Jackets 3-0. Also tonight, the Leafs at home to Boston. The Canadians are in Florida. Minnesota will break the Thrasher. So you can see this is a um, fairly high fidelity detector, in fact. Um, I uh, have a 10,000 ohm load on it before feeding my one transistor amplifier. So this was uh, what indicated to me that it's uh, a high impedance detector. In fact, it works very well if there's uh, upwards of of uh, 100k ohms as a load on the detector. So what we've seen so far is that the original nickel filings coherer was relatively insensitive, probably requiring 100,000 microvolts per meter field strength or something in that neighborhood in order to get reliable results. The uh, graphite coherer working more as a uh, crystal detector works, being somewhat more sensitive but uh, not very practical for areas where there might be vibration like on a ship for example, and the mercury iron carbon coherer which uh, is quite sensitive relatively speaking. I did bridge it with a uh, silicon diode just to uh, check and uh, as I say, using a high impedance load, it appears to be just about as sensitive as the uh, silicon diode would be. So that is the uh, that early series of detectors. Uh, we'll now go on to other experiments uh, in this nature and reviewing the history of detectors in those very early days. Well, building on the ideas of the mercury iron carbon detector. Uh, professors Lodge and Muirhead developed this uh, variation. It consists, as you'll see, of a hard rubber cup with uh, mercury in it, shown in blue, and uh, running slightly in the surface of the mercury is a knife edge wheel. This is driven by clockwork or an electric motor, slowly re rotating. And up on the upper left hand side there's a, um, a piece of felt which is soaked in oil and as the wheel rotates through this it becomes coated with oil and this film of oil insulates it from the mercury until such time as a radio signal arrives when that microscopically thin layer of oil is broken down. So this is more like a uh, early nickel filings coherer 
than a uh, rectifying detector. Here you see a rather poor photograph of an actual uh, large mirror head mercury uh, auto coherer or detector. You can see the uh, adjustment uh, on the upper right which moves the knife edge wheel up or down into the uh, mercury and uh, an initial adjustment knob on the left. The whole thing is uh, apparently in a brass case with a hard rubber cup underneath that wheel on the left uh, which contains the mercury and a terminal below it. So uh, there's two terminals of course. I did not try to make a replica of this because of the uh, precise machining required and in any event it uh, operates much as the iron mercury carbon coherer did. The next uh, detector in my series here is this ticker or sliding contact detector. Yeah, it's kind of hard belie to believe that this uh, could work, but nevertheless, uh, it's in the box. On the left is a motor which drives a wheel which has a, a groove in the center to track this uh, sliding metal contact that you see on the top. And uh, the wheel or motor is um, grounded and the rest of the circuit goes to the um, tuning coil and the antenna. And the idea here is that this imperfect sliding contact on the wheel interrupts the incoming radio frequency waveform at various uh, and different places. So in fact, in any earphones connected across this thing, you should hear a uh, sort of a scratchy tone whenever radio frequency energy is being received, let's say telegraphically, from the antenna. So I've actually uh, made a model of this which we'll try. Firstly I'll show you the simple circuit diagram. Well again it's pretty simple. I have here a series tuned circuit which as I mentioned before uh, provides maximum current at resonance. Uh, the junction of the coil and the tuning capacitor has maximum voltage at that point but that's kind of irrelevant here in this circuit and the circuit is grounded through this uh, sliding contact. So I put the earphones across the sliding contact and uh, this is where you should hear the uh, scratchy tone as I mentioned it coming in whenever there's uh, RF coming to the antenna. <coughs> Once again I have uh, replaced the earphones with an amplifier just so we can hear the effect of this particular kind of detector. Well, here's my experimental setup, tuning condenser and coil on the right, and here's my uh, squirrel cage motor with the uh, sliding contact, which I'll now give a close-up of. So there's my sliding contact, it's just a little pulley with a piece of uh, brass sh shim stock riding on it, and uh, this, as I said before, is in the uh, ground connection of the uh, tuning coil. So let's start it up and see what happens. Here is my setup again with my amplifier connected. I have a signal generator attached to a telegraph key to uh, apply the RF to my circuit just so it'll seem more like a real wireless telegraph unit. And the signal generator is working at about 480 kilohertz. So I've now got the little wheel rotating <coughs> and the amplifier set up. So I'll try my key and see what happens. So you can see it does uh, detect as advertised and gives that sort of um, high frequency buzz. It's relatively insensitive is my view. I've got my signal generator working at at least a half a volt peak to peak coming in there to the series tuned circuit. So this was probably something that was useful for relatively uh, short range situations I would suggest. Well, there you have some of the uh, fairly early and I guess you could say exotic attempts at uh, radio detectors. This is before crystal detectors uh, like galena and iron pyrites and so forth 
it came into use and uh, as I said before it seems to be a long sequence of experiments on uh, somewhat exotic techniques to try to get better detectors at least ones that were more stable and easier to use especially on board ship. So now I'm going to explore uh, some uh, further developments in this, this field. Um, these ones tend to be a little later in the sequence, electrolytic detectors, primary cell detectors, Marconi's magnetic detector, and so on. Well here we have the electrolytic detector. You see that it's a very, very fine platinum wire dipping into a little glass vial of uh, nitric acid, 20% acid. This platinum wire is only 0.0001 inch in diameter and sometimes it was enclosed in a, a very fine glass tube with only the tip showing. This detector is uh, put in series with a battery and the earphones and the idea is that the local battery generates uh, tiny bubbles of oxygen at the platinum wire which eventually polarize uh, this little cell and decrease the current flow until such time as radio frequency energy comes along from the antenna and breaks down these bubbles. Now, this was described as being a very sensitive detector although extremely difficult to get uh, adjusted in the first case but once adjusted apparently it was quite satisfactory. It was used prior of course to the development of uh, detectors using galena and iron pyrites and so on. Now a variation of this is the so-called primary cell detector which I'll show next. Now this is the primary cell detector. You'll see the uh, difference is that uh, here the solution used is 20% sulfuric acid and there's a zinc electrode on the left hand side and again this very fine platinum wire on the right. The claim to fame for the primary cell detector was that it did not require an external battery because obviously having uh, a platinum anode and zinc cathode it's going to develop a, a small electromotive force itself and this is apparently sufficient to make it work. I don't have any information on the uh, reported sensitivity of this detector. I suppose it was probably about the same as the uh, electrolytic detector which preceded it. Well here I have uh, constructed a uh, electrolytic detector. You see on the left there's a carbon rod that's the um, cathode here. I didn't have platinum so I wanted something that's non-reactive with uh, acid. And in the middle there's a nail with a very very fine uh, German silver wire coming out at the end. And I've covered this with uh, fingernail polish, everything except the very tip of it. Now this is certainly not um, a platinum wire and it's certainly not 0 .0001 inches in diameter, it's more like 0 .0015 but um, with the acid in the little cup there I think this is going to be sufficient to at least demonstrate the sound that one heard in the earphones um, when this thing was in a quiescent state waiting for RF energy to come in off the antenna. So I'll do the experiment and you should be able to hear something of what this uh, detector sounded like in the old days. I'm now going to um, connect power to my circuit here. You should be able to uh, hear the detector noise. It's described as a roaring noise in the earphones in some of the old books that I have. So here I will uh, connect the power. You hear that sound like uh, bacon frying. That's the uh, detector in operation. I'm now going to apply about um, a half a volt of RF to the antenna circuit. Um, you should be able to hear some change in the sound. And you hear that background frying noise uh, decreases slightly. Uh, when I apply my uh, RF signal. 
which was unmodulated, of course. So this is the uh, electrolytic detector. I think that probably the experiment would be a lot more successful if I had an actual platinum wire because uh, the German silver, I think, is being uh, attacked by the sulfuric acid and therefore you don't get just the effect of the polarization by oxygen bubbles but also this uh, other chemical reaction that's going on. But nevertheless, it uh, does give some indication of uh, what you'd expect out of this detector. And my model, of course, is not very sensitive, but um, I'll just let you hear this noise again briefly. Now, you might think that would be uh, perhaps a bit annoying to have to listen to that. Uh, when you're getting a telegraphic signal, but I suppose um, if it was as sensitive as claimed and uh, once adjusted relatively trouble-free, well, I guess that probably made it all worthwhile. Well, our friend uh, Reginald Fessenden had not been idle in this debate over different types of uh, detectors, and he was uh, certainly searching for something better than some of these rudimentary types that I've uh, discussed so far. In uh, this little book, The Superheterodyne Receiver, there's a little bit about um, one of Fessenden's more unique uh, inventions. In fact, it was possibly the start of the uh, application of the superheterodyne principle. In fact, uh, it says there was no doubt during the consideration of this problem, that is the uh, difficulty in getting any great range out of the coherer, that it occurred to Reginald Fessenden, an American engineer it says here, uh, that an improvement might be achieved at the transmitting station were to send out signals in such a way that their combined effects at the receiver reproduced the desired signal. That is, he was looking for a beat effect uh, at the receiver. Fessenden's patent covering this idea, filed on the 28th of September 1901, was the first of a number of important steps leading away from other types of receiver toward the superheterodyne. And there's actually some uh, words by Fessenden himself on this uh, idea. He's um, speaking in the so-called electrical review back around the time of his patent says all forms of voltage operated receivers and most forms of current operated receivers with the exception of two or three of the writer's invention are very inefficient and then he speaks of the uh, liquid uh, barometer or barometer as I demonstrated um, which as a sense of any of those has an efficiency of only about one tenth of one percent for weak signals in the writer's experiments, the magnetic receiver is rather less efficient, he says. That's less so than the liquid detector. He says a liquid a bolometer or a magnetic receiver will give an audible indication between one one hundredth and one one thousandth of an erg. I know an erg isn't something that leaps uh, rapidly to mind as representing a quantity that we all recognize, but if you look up the uh, conversion factors, it uh, seems to be that one erg per second is 10 to the minus 7 watts. So if you do some quick calculations, uh, assuming uh, Morse telegraphy, maybe a, a tenth of a second, say, for a dot and uh, twice as long for a dash, then you can calculate that that kind of sensitivity, that is one one hundredth of an erg, would uh, provide maybe 70 microvolts at a receiver, uh, or if the antenna that's attached to is 50 meters long, that's a field strength of about 3.5 millivolts per meter. That's um, not too bad, but it's also about a thousand times worse than uh, any modern superheterodyne, just to give an idea of uh, how these detectors performed. So what I've done is uh, constructed uh, a model of Fessenden's heterodyne receiver. It's really, in his original design, uh, just a um, short bundle of very, very fine iron wires with two windings on it. And I'll show this in a diagram. 
Here is the uh, diagram for the heterodyne uh, detector. You'll see that uh, horizontal bundle of uh, fine wires. Apparently they were point .ot hot one inch in diameter each one. This of course is to avoid uh, hysteresis effects at these frequencies. In front of the bundle is a steel diaphragm, just like an earphone actually. Although probably in ca his case it looked more like uh, one of those old uh, handheld telephone receivers. The uh, core has one winding for the connection to antenna and ground. And then on the other winding is a high frequency alternator. And you can see what's going to happen here is that the uh, high frequency alternator will provide a uh, fairly uh, high strength alternating field in this bundle of iron wires and uh, the radio frequency energy coming in on the other winding if the two frequencies are close um, is going to produce a beat effect which can then be actually heard by the steel diaphragm. This was fastened in this way of uh, directly converting uh, from inaudible RF down to uh, the audible range. This of course is for um, telegraphy so it could be quite uh, useful because you can adjust the high frequency alternator to get the kind of beat note that you want and pick it out amongst all the atmospherics. Apparently this is one of the problems with the uh, liquid detector for example that it was uh, very hard to hear uh, at longer distances the uh, telegraphic signal instrument amongst static. One of the books I have says that this detector actually achieved a range of more than 3,000 miles in one test. Now I assume that there was a, a goodly amount of power at the transmitting station for this test and also huge antennas, but nevertheless uh, it was quite an advance. And I will now uh, demonstrate this uh, particular kind of detector. Here it is, all laid out on my bench. You will see there's, uh, first of all, an old earphone I have modified for this purpose. And uh, off to the top of the picture, there's a small one transistor generator for the um, high frequency energizing signal uh, for which uh, Fessenden himself used a uh, high frequency alternator in fact, but uh, this is certainly a simpler way to do the demonstration. And for my uh, incoming radio signal I'm going to use uh, my Hickok signal generator which uh, gets connected to the uh, second winding in my earphone there. I'll now uh, show a close-up of my modified earphone. You see what I've got here is um, an old uh, brand's uh, earphone. I've taken out the original electrical part and in here I've got um, a toroidal pot core and I've made uh, two windings uh, to insert inside this. And I've uh, shimmed uh, the whole core so that it's level with the uh, outside surface of this uh, earphone uh, cup. Then I use this uh, paper diaphragm, sorry, paper uh, gasket, I guess, to space the diaphragm here, the original diaphragm, just uh, that distance above the uh, poles of the pot core. So this leaves it uh, extremely close uh, to the magnetic fields that are going to be generated here. Here it is all uh, reassembled. I've got uh, two cables coming out of it, uh, actually quite fine wires until I put it onto that white cable. The white cable provides the um, RF high frequency sine wave that's going to energize the core and the other uh, fine wires coming out go up to my signal generator. And the signal generator is working at uh, about 160 kilohertz as is my um, RF generator over there and uh, the reason for this is this is roughly in the neighborhood of uh, what high frequency alternators could provide in Fessenden's day and was around the um, frequency that he was working with when he invented his heterodyne detector. So what remains now is to energize both units and I'll have to put a microphone up to the earphone to see if uh, the results can be heard on this recording.
I don't have a um, telegraph key connected to my signal generator here, so you're going to hear a continuous tone. But I'll uh, put the microphone up to the earphone now, and uh, it'll make a bit of noise before it gets attached. But you should be able to hear then the um, beat note that this uh, little heterodyne telephone is receiving. Here goes. So there you have uh, the Fessenden heterodyne detector in operation. I actually um, tested the sensitivity of this unit with my signal generator here. It looks like I got down to uh, a signal of about 20 millivolts uh, peak to peak before I actually lost audibility. So that's um, actually pretty good. It's um, a lot better than the coherer or the liquid detector. Uh, in my experience and um, must be approaching that of a crystal detector 20 millivolts peak to peak to get an audible indication on a telephone for uh, telegraphic signals uh, I think isn't bad again uh, you could calculate what this is in microvolts per meter on a 50 or 100 meter antenna but I suspect uh, for those days this was regarded as uh, quite an advance and, Well, further to the uh, advances in uh, detectors over the very, very earlier ones, uh, another one, of course, was Marconi's magnetic detector, which depended on hysteresis changes in a iron wire moving under the influence of a couple of magnets and also um, under the influence of radio frequency energy coming in from the antenna. This has been stated in some books to be not very sensitive. That's certainly what uh, Fessenden said when he was developing his uh, hydrodyne detector. So what I'm going to do is uh, build a, a small model of this uh, magnetic detector and uh, just see how it does really perform. Just to refresh uh, people's memory, here is the uh, schematic diagram of a magnetic detector. You'll see there's a stranded uh, steel wire loop that's running around a couple of um, ebonite pulleys. This goes through that uh, little bobbin at the bottom. There's a glass tube. Uh, the first winding has about uh, 10 turns of uh, fairly heavy uh, copper wire on it. The second winding is uh, somewhere uh, up to 2,000 ohms. Uh, many books recommend uh, something down in the neighborhood of 200 ohms with earphones to match. And then there are those two horseshoe magnets uh, disposed uh, just above the little bobbin with um, north poles on the outer sides and the south poles uh, together just over that um, middle uh, higher impedance bobbin. The antenna connects to the 10 turn coil, of course, and the earphones connect to the higher impedance coil, and then these um, pulleys rotate relatively slowly, dragging the stranded steel wire uh, through the bobbin. And the wire itself, of course, is multi stranded, strands insulated from each other. Uh, to avoid eddy current losses at the frequencies that this is working at. And uh, in one book at least, I noticed that it said uh, a good working frequency for the magnetic detector was about 2,500 meters, which is obviously a fairly long wavelength. And uh, when I go to test this device, if my model works, I'm going to use uh, those uh, relatively low frequencies just as Marconi would have done way back in those early days. Here's my somewhat crude model set up on my workbench. You'll see there's a couple of pulleys at either side which I'm going to turn by a crank rather than have a clockwork motor. It's hardly worthwhile for a demonstration. And I did not use great big uh, horseshoe magnets. It's not necessary nowadays because you can get very small, very high strength rare earth magnets. And that's what I've used um, cemented to a couple of brackets either side of the bobbin. I'll now show a close up of this uh, little model.
Well, here's one of my pulleys. Uh, you see emerging from it there is a uh, stranded iron wire. That's actually a picture framing wire because it's nice uh, soft iron and I have oxidized that by heating it to a red heat in uh, a torch flame and then uh, letting it oxidize and then putting oil on it as well. Now there's my little bobbin. You see the uh, very dark red uh, this thing in the middle, that's the uh, high impedance winding and then there's a glass tube and underneath the yellow parts uh, I actually have uh, 20 turns of wire, it's um, oh, perhaps number 26 wire, something like that, insulated and there are my two brackets uh, with the rare earth magnets You'll see they're uh, extremely small, but the, I can tell you they are very, very powerful. And I've got a south pole on each side of the larger winding, and at each end of the glass tube there is a north pole. And um, I actually have a 60 kilohertz generator feeding this because I couldn't in my signal generator get um, high enough uh, signal output to represent what uh, might have been gotten out of the aerial in those days. So it's about uh, about one volt at 60 kilohertz. So uh, all it remains now is uh, to see how this is going to work. And just before uh, doing the demonstration I should explain that uh, a couple of books at least uh, give two different accounts of the operation of this detector. One says that uh, when the abrupt hysteresis change occurs between those south poles you hear a click when the incoming uh, RF wave is applied. Another says that as the iron wire is being drawn through the bobbin you hear in the earphones a sort of a background uh, hiss and the hiss changes uh, in character as the uh, bursts of RF energy come in. So um, I'm going to be looking for both effects, uh, neither of which are going to be very pronounced I think in a magnetic detector like this, particularly uh, in times of great uh, background static. But nevertheless, it's uh, worth a try. Well, once again I have uh, an amplifier attached to my detector just so that um, a recording can be made. I hope that the background hiss is going to be noticeable when I um, turn the pulleys here so I'm not going to just do that so you can hear what this uh, hiss was like, this uh, hysteresis effect as the iron wire goes through the bobbin. Now you can see there there's also what you might call microphonics from the uh, wire banging against the sides of the tubes under the influence of the magnet so naturally that produces some background noise as well. So what I have here is my generator which I'm, I'm not going to try to put Morse code on it. I didn't have enough room to put a key in but uh, I will turn the, the um, pulleys and uh, then apply my signal at 60 kilohertz and I'll leave it there for a while just to see the difference in the character of the background noise. So I've got my uh, signal generator over here. You can see it makes a click anyway when I apply it. So now I will uh, start turning the bobbin, or rather turning the uh, pulleys and draw the wire through and you'll hear that background hiss. Apply the signal. Off again, apply the signal, and off again, and I'll apply it again. So you can see what that would sound like. It sounds like something that would be quite difficult to use in my estimation. That's my uh, demonstration of uh, a magnetic detector. As I said, in order to get that effect, I really needed about um, oh, one volt peak to peak as a signal. Now, if one had a uh, 
350 foot antenna as they very often did in those days um, and uh, maybe a field strength of uh, 5 millivolts per meter or something you could uh, expect to get that kind of um, a signal coming in from your tuned circuit and uh, under those circumstances the detector would work. I guess uh, Fessenden was right when he compared the electrolytic detector and magnetic detector in terms of their uh, 100 ergs or so of uh, sensitivity, which really wasn't all that great. Well, just before leaving the magnetic detector, I just wanted to show this uh, hysteresis diagram as to what's going on there. Here you have um, the uh, flux density experienced by the wire. This is the um, magnetic intensity or the magnif magnetic field as applied by the um, rare earth mag magnets that I used. And as the wire passes through this field, it goes through this hysteresis curve and come back here to uh, zero applied magnetic uh, intensity, but there's still some residual magnetism. And then comes down toward the uh, south pole in the middle of the bobbin and then back up uh, to the following north pole. And the thing is when RF energy is applied, when it's uh, between the two uh, S poles you have this little uh, small hysteresis curve that's being generated by the um, radio frequency energy coming into the antenna. So this is the part that's uh, between the S poles and here it is uh, outside of the bobbin. Here the wire enters the bobbin and here it leaves. So the, uh, the point is that this uh, change in hysteresis curve which is causing the hiss in the headphones according to one of the books that I have, uh, this has changed when all along this area here you have these smaller hysteresis curves being generated by the radio frequency energy. Uh, supposedly that's what uh, changes the character of the sound on the headphones and gives evidence of uh, an incoming uh, telegraphic signal. So that's the theory anyway. It's actually far more complex than that, I think. And there has been some disagreement in various books about the operation of the detector, but that's as close as I can come here. That really wraps up the story as far as early detectors um, prior to Galena, crystal detectors and so forth is concerned. These were primarily for the detection of wireless telegraphy. And uh, now we move on to the crystal detector, various forms of that. And you might wonder, how is this discovered? It's not something that's going to uh, just leap to mind overnight, so to speak. And in uh, the book, uh, Transistors Theory and Applications, written about uh, 1960 or thereabouts, a little earlier, it says that um, the first observations of the phenomenon of asymmetrical conduction were apparently made by Mr. Monk in 1835, experimenting with uh, various minerals. So it was a, a chemist or a physicist who discovered that, but it says no practical use was made of the fact that metals in contact with certain minerals and compounds would perform the unilateral conductivity essential to detection until about 1906 when Henry Harrison Chase Dunwoody, then with the DeForest Wireless uh, Company, but who had served in the United States Signal Corps, invented the carborundum crystal detector. So obviously armed with uh, Monk's researches, he did some experiments on his own. And uh, this was not the normal cat's whisker type of crystal detector that we think of now, but rather a, a piece of carborundum with rather a heavy uh, pressure on it from a metallic point. Uh, it says then that um, carborundum, that is uh, silicon carbide, must have uh, suggested the idea of silicon to Greenleaf Whittier Pickard, who filed a patent in 1906 for a crystal detector in the form we know today. That is a cat whisker in contact with the crystal. So uh, about 1906 uh, when, when that patent was issued and after that of course there was a great rush of experimentation to determine uh, all kinds of materials that might act uh, as a um, detector and uh, minerals also uh, used one with the other as in the paracon detector.
So now we'll delve into the crystal detector briefly and uh, see where that leads us in this uh, study of um, early detectors before the vacuum tube. Well obviously this is the um, crystal detector that we're all relatively familiar with and uh, of course there were several variations of this in attempts to find uh, improved versions. As uh, one example, this is the so-called lead peroxide detector. There's a little pellet of lead peroxide on the left-hand um, contact there. And you see also a uh, contact spring that's uh, adjustable for pressure by that right-hand screw. And uh, I guess this would be relatively easy to adjust compared to a cat's whisker. That was perhaps one of the advantages of it. And I believe this one required a uh, small bias voltage as well. Here we have uh, one form of the uh, carborundum detector. You can see it's uh, a lot more robust. Uh, one of the advantages was you can use fairly high pressure on the carborundum crystal. Um, thus it's uh, fairly stable. And uh, the other thing is it does require a small bias. You can see in this uh, detail of the drawing here just uh, what these two uh, points look like that could be impressed upon the uh, carborundum crystal. Obviously this is not a terribly delicate affair, as I say, one of its advantages. And uh, here's one of those detectors that use a couple of kinds of uh, mineral, uh, one acting against the other for presumably a better uh, characteristic curve of the little rectifier that is formed. Uh, this is also known as the Paracon detector, and I guess it uh, was also a little less critical of adjustment than the standard Galena and uh, Cat Whisker uh, design. So here you see the um, fairly common Galena crystal uh, in a little pellet of woods metal, which melts at a very low temperature, so it doesn't disturb the Galena too much and a cat's whisker on the end of this little articulated arm. In fact, at the end of that fairly obvious cat whisker, there is a very fine wire that you probably can't see in this video, and that is to allow uh, adjustment with a much lighter pressure because of the uh, extreme sensitivity of Galena to pressure. And uh, here you see another um, crystal detector. There is a cat whisker there with an articulated arm, and down below there's a little uh, brass block with a thumb screw. And the advantage of this is you can put any kind of lump of mineral in there, screw it tight, and you've got a detector. This one is, in fact, uh, manufactured by Ducrete in Paris in the uh, early 1900s. I guess, as I say, the advantage was if you didn't like uh, Galena, you could put uh, iron pyrites in there, or boronite, or whatever happened to be handy. Anyway, it's uh, quite a different configuration, very uh, European, you might say. Well, what I'm going to do now in this um, rather nicely cluttered uh, workplace of mine is to uh, demonstrate the characteristic curve of a uh, typical Galena detector. I'll also show the um, characteristic curve of a normal silicon diode just uh, for comparison. And for this purpose I've manufactured a uh, soft tooth wave generator and I'm going to feed the um, vertical and horizontal inputs of my rather old oscilloscope and hopefully get a um, characteristic curve that makes some sense. So here you see I've got my silicon diode in place and um, at that uh, orange-red arrow on the uh, voltage axis, the horizontal axis, that's about 0 0.7 volts where the normal silicon diode starts to conduct. So uh, again, my uh, horizontal axis is voltage and my vertical axis is current. I just feed my uh, sawtooth wave form to the diode with the horizontal uh, axis of the scope fed from the waveform, and the diode goes in series with the 47K resistor, and I take the voltage off the 47K resistor, which represents current through the diode. So there you see a standard 1N914 uh, silicon diode, and um, I will now change to a Galena detector and uh, see how that looks. Mm -hmm.
Well, first I wanted to show uh, what you get when you do not have uh, a good contact point on the uh, crystal of Galena. You see you get this um, curve that has a flat section in the middle and it's virtually identical at both ends. Now this might work if you had some slight bias on the crystal so you could work on the um, right half of the curve otherwise you're just going to get um, rather distorted RF uh, energy of both polarities uh, coming out to the earphones. So now find a, a good spot and show what that looks like. Here you see a good spot, you would call it, on the Galena crystal. You see that's uh, actually a very good curve. It's um, quite steep to the right and virtually flat on the left. And um, if you visualize sort of uh, coming up from the bottom, an RF uh, sine wave, this is obviously going to perform uh, very well as a right to fire. This is, in fact, a freshly broken surface of uh, Galena. So um, I could expect to find a, a point like this, in fact, on this particular crystal, which I'm using in that uh, Cat's Whisker detector I showed earlier. And there are several such points where you can get this uh, really good kind of characteristic curve, and this compares uh, very favorably with any silicon or germanium uh, production diode that one might get today. So, in respect of that, um, I guess you could say that this would be a good detector in comparison to a commercial diode because, of course, uh, there is no sort of lag in the voltage at which it uh, starts to work. It's pretty well crossing the zero axis, as you can see there. Well, here I've substituted a piece of uh, molybdenite. It's a kind of a flaky material, a bit like asbestos, not asbestos, but mica, silver looking, and uh, requires, oddly enough, a, a fair amount of pressure to um, get this curve. You can see it's an excellent curve, but looking at that uh, orange arrow again, you'll see it will need bias to move the curve off to the left so you don't lose uh, the first uh, 0.6 volts or so of the RF uh, incoming wave. It's also, uh, I found, uh, of quite high impedance, so um, I guess one could say 4,000 ohm headphones would be needed. And they're kind of rare, but they can be obtained if one was going to use molybdenite um, as a detector. It's, uh, its advantage is that it's uh, wonderfully easy to adjust and uh, it looks to here in my sample to be extremely stable. I have in fact uh, taken a small flake and mounted it on a uh, strip of brass for the purpose of uh, tracing this curve. Well, here I've substituted a piece of iron pyrite. You can see it's certainly not anything to write home about. First of all, you'd have to bias it off to the left because it's a symmetrical curve with that distorted bit in the middle. And uh, you can see it's very unstable with respect to pressure, just the way the curve is jumping around there. And I have a very, very light pressure on this already. Obviously, it would work if it was biased uh, a bit, but um, in this particular sample anyway, it uh, certainly doesn't uh, outshine Galena or Molybdenite. However, very often uh, different samples of the same mineral can be uh, widely different in their characteristics and I dare say that there are bits of iron and copper pyrite that one can get uh, that will work better than this one here. Well, I thought I'd try one last curve. Uh, this is my attempt at a paracon detector. In fact, it's a uh, junction between uh, iron pyrite and galena. Now, uh, Paracon was actually a boronite and zincite, but uh, they're kind of hard to get. And you can see what we have here is an interesting combination of the two. The uh, right-hand half of the curve clearly represents the steep um, characteristic of Galena, and the left hand is uh, the other half of that S-curve you get uh, with iron pyrite. This, again, would need bias. You see uh, where the breakpoint is at the orange area, arrow there. It's about uh, 0 0.6 or 7 volts. So you'd have to bias this thing with a half a volt or more off to the left. And uh, because of the relatively long flat area there, you'd get um, quite good rectification for uh, smaller signals. Um, 
clearly it would overload um, relatively easily because then the RF would start to catch that uh, uh, downward going curve on the left and you get uh, tips of the RF there coming through and uh, causing distortion or uh, reducing the signal amplitude in the um, earphones. That in fact is very close to the end of the uh, story but there is one uh, detector that I should mention um, before leaving the subject largely because it was a uh, precursor to the uh, first generation of electronics I guess and uh, that was the uh, flame detector. Here is a diagram of the flame detector obviously it's a gas-fired Bunsen burner and in the lower cooler part of the flame there is a small platinum trough with some alkaline salt maybe uh, sodium hydroxide in that part of the flame and in the tip or hot part of the flame there's a platinum rod obviously the idea is that the alkaline salt provides positive ions which uh, if the upper rod is negative should provide a unidirectional uh, current flow thus providing uh, the rectification action required of a detector now this one was not terribly practical because it's very unstable with respect to small air currents and other disturbances as the book says and uh, because I had no platinum of course I did not try to construct a model of this one I think its primary importance is that it uh, sort of pointed the way toward uh, thermionic effects and ultimately uh, the vacuum tube. I'm sure some will remember of course that uh, the Edison effect was first noticed in a carbon filament lamp such as this one and uh, furthermore that there was a not only a darkening of the bulb as shown here but also a clear port part of the uh, lamp opposite the electrodes which showed that something coming off the filament was being repelled uh, by one of the electrodes and of course this was working on DC current at the time. Now what I'd like to do now is briefly review the results of these experiments bearing in mind that uh, my models were probably a bit crude by the standards of uh, those days when they had improved these detectors considerably. But nevertheless, it will give uh, some appreciation of how they all rank and you might say how they compare with uh, the results of today's technology. Here we have the first three in the series. This is a detector sensitivity summary. And what I show beside each uh, little diagram is uh, the sensitivity that I obtained in volts peak to peak as uh, seen on my oscilloscope. The first one is the coherer. That's the one with the nickel and silver filings. Uh, and it required about one volt. The graphite detector is the next one with a sensitivity of about 0 0.5 volts. And my version of Fessenden's bolometer required about 0 0.5 volts, but as I say, that was using a type 327 lamp. I'm quite sure that uh, his bolometer with the platinum wire 0 0.0006 inches in diameter was going to be a lot more sensitive than that, that uh, possibly even down into the uh, 0 0.05 volt range, I would suspect. Next is the mercury iron carbon auto coherer as it was called and for that um, I required about uh, 0 0.3 volts peak to peak. The next one was the sliding contact detector and I got uh, reasonable results with about 0 0.4 volts peak to peak. I suspect both of those uh, were more sensitive in their uh, configurations in those early days than the models that I built. And the electrolytic detector in my version, which as I said you did not use the correct acid and did not have the really fine platinum wire, required about 0 0.5 volts peak to peak. My suspicion is uh, 
since that was regarded as being a sensitive detector in the early days, uh, possibly 100 millivolts or something would have been adequate uh, to make it work effectively. Strangely enough, my model of the Fessenden heterodyne detector was the most successful of, of all, and it's the one that I had the least hopes for. And uh, for that, I did get a sensitivity of about 20 millivolts peak to peak for a readable um, uh, sound in the earphones. My model of uh, Marconi's magnetic detector required about one volt peak to peak. And as I say, if I had had better iron wire, finer and better insulated, possibly a better positioning of the magnets, I suspect this would probably work down to maybe a quarter of a volt. You may remember Fessenden characterized it as being not a very sensitive detector. And finally, of course, the crystal detector with uh, Galena. It requires maybe 0.1 volt for adequate operation. Other ones like Carborundum uh, were a little less sensitive but had the advantage of uh, not being so critical with respect to cat whisker pressure, but they also required uh, bias. So that is a brief summary of the results of all of these experiments. If you um, look through the various literature, um, from about 1909, for example, um, Mr. Lafter's book on operators, wireless telegraph and telephone, that's 1909, it's largely concerned with the coherer as a detector uh, and does mention the um, magnetic detector and electrolytic detector. In Harper's Wireless book, which is uh, 1913, there is uh, still no great mention of the audion. Virtually everything is associated uh, with crystal detectors and uh, also some rather strange schemes for modulating the transmitter for uh, wireless telephony. And by the time you get to uh, the Wireless Experimenter's Manual, which is uh, 1920, just after the First World War, that uh, book is taken up in large part by um, tube-type circuits, but uh, there is a section about uh, that thick which deals still quite extensively with magnetic detectors, electrolytic detectors, and uh, various forms of the crystal detector. So these early schemes serve very well for uh, almost two decades after the introduction of commercial wireless telegraphy and other and wireless uh, telephony as far as that goes. And uh, the most of these were phased out except of course for the crystal detector which lasted uh, well through the 1920s as a simple means to have a cheap radio for the commercial broadcasting services which uh, were then uh, coming online. So there you have it. That's a overview of early detectors before the vacuum tube. Uh, it seems to me it's a history of quite uh, ingenious attempts to circumvent the lack of any form of amplification and clearly from the results that one reads about transmission distances of thousands of miles um, these early experimenters and scientists were able to squeeze quite a lot out of a very very rudimentary system.